Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to let people trickle in uh, while we get started, but uh, welcome all to the Our Shared History Report GRCX program, where we will be discussing in a panel um, Boston systemic racism and Boston's climate opportunities. And this is being presented by the Boston Green Ribbon Commission and Embrace. Um, so yeah, we'll just give everyone like about 30 seconds to join here, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, once again, we are starting in just a minute here. Um, Zoom does let everyone in the waiting in, waiting room in slowly. So um, just giving everyone a second to trickle in and then we're gonna get started in just a moment. All right, I think we're petering off. So um, hi everyone. And once again, welcome to our GRCX program. Um, we are discussing the Our Shared History Report and um, systemic racism and Boston's climate opportunities. My name is Azanta Takor and I am the, GRC, the GRC's administrative coordinator and project manager. I will be your moderator for today. And I will also be presenting a little bit about the report in the beginning before our panelists start. And um, a little bit about our program. So we completed this report back in um, March. We released it earlier this year, and it was com completed in collaboration with Embrace Boston to lay the foundation for an open dialogue among a wide variety of our stakeholders in Boston's future who hope to explicitly and consciously use a shift to a resilient post-carbon economy um, as an opportunity to eradicate the harms of racism embedded into our built environment. So the report addresses three main topics, patterns of racial injustice, climate inequities, and equitable climate action opportunities. As I'm sure you all are very aware as the very audience we are trying to target with this report, we are very much in an era of systemic transformation in Boston compelled by climate change. So through this report, the GRC hopes that the historical account will both serve to inform our shared vis vision of progress, but also really propel the dialogue forward so that we can continue taking advantage of um, the opportunities available to us. Uh, so before I get into our panelists and um, a little bit more about the report, I want to share some logistics. So if you have any questions, please put them into the chat and our staff will collect them for me to ask our panelists at the very end where we'll be doing a QA. and a and um, Make, please make sure that you're staying off video and muted um, while the program is happening. And also you can enable captions at the bottom of your screen if you need them. If you have any issues or technical issues accessing anything, please put them in the chat and we will help you. And last thing is uh, the program is being recorded. So we'll put this up on our website at the conclusion of the panel. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit into our agenda. We're gonna be sharing an overview of the shared history report, as I mentioned, and then we will be delving into the development in Boston and historic harms, and then unpacking patterns of racial injustice in Boston, and finally discussing the recommendations of the report and the future of climate justice in Boston. And then we'll end with a moderated discussion and a Q&A with our panelists. Next slide. So we have some really great people here with us today. Thank you all for joining us and taking the time to share your thoughts with our audience. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna do some introductions. So we're joined by um, Ted Landsmark, who is a distinguished professor of public policy and urban affairs and the director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy at Northeastern University. Ted is a civic planner, civil rights and equity advocate higher education administrator, arts and cultural researcher, and community engaged social activist in Boston and nationally. As director of the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy, Professor Landsmark oversees interdisciplinary research on urban policy matters and was Mayor, um, Wal Mayor Walsh's first appointment to the Boston Planning and Development Agency's Board of Directors. We are also joined by Dr. Amari, Amari Paris Jeffries, um, who is the president and CEO of Embrace Boston. Amari is the CEO and president where he is leading a citywide racial equity movement through the Embrace Memorial, the National Embrace Center, and arts and cultural centered community organizing efforts. One of Embrace Boston's initiatives includes the creation of a living memorial honoring the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King and their life in Boston. 
Harris Jeffries was named to Boston Magazine's list of 150 most influential Bostonians and to Boston Business Journal's Power 50. A three-time graduate of UMass Boston, he recently received his PhD through UMass Boston's higher education program. He is an Army veteran serving from 1991 to 1996. And we are also joined by Reverend Mariama Whitehammond, who is the Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Space at the City of Boston. She was appointed to that role in April 2021, and in that role, she oversees policy and programs on energy, climate change, food justice, historic preservation, and open space. Reverend Mariama was born and raised in Boston and began her community engagement in high school. In 2017, she graduated with her Master of Divinity at Boston University School of Theology and was ordained an elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. In 2018, she founded New Roots AME Church in Dorchester, where she currently pastors. All right, so next slide, and I will share a little bit with the report with you all. And also, um, if you, I'm gonna put the link to the report in the chat here. If you haven't had the chance to take a gander at a report, completely unbiased opinion, but it, it is a great report. Um, and I highly recommend, um, I will very much give you a high level summary of what we discussed in each of the three sections, um, but I'm not gonna get too, too much into it because I wanna uh, really make sure that we hear from our three panelists. So next slide. As I mentioned, the first section of the report really talks about the historic harms in, Bo in, in Boston through patterns of racial injustice. So um, a lot there, it really can be, um, the main points can be taken away through five takeaways. So the first two really relate to housing and the way Boston has been structured through redlining and disinvestment, as well as suburbanization and zoning separated usages. Um, and then also, um, I'm sure a lot of us are well aware, the underfunding of public schools uh, for students of color, there is still a wide gap for students of color um, across the city of Boston that um, need to be addressed, as well as the, I'm sure, again, all our lived experiences with the MBTA, uh, the transit system has been developed to serve wealthier suburbs, and um, that that gap very much still exists within the way the MBTA functions to this day. And a little bit into our pu the public health of Boston, there are just less gr less green space and fewer parks in um, the our our environmental justice communities and environmental justice areas of Boston. Next slide. So. Boston has the infamous reputation of being the country's most racist city, as some of you may or may not know, and has been well documented by the Boston Globe. And I do want to share this fact from the report. Uh, it was estimated based on 2010 census data that 69% of Bostonians would have to move elsewhere in the city for Boston to have an even racial distribution of black and white residents, which is a very much an indicator of high degree of segregation um, in this very majority minority city. And um, as you know, our, our rent is, is skyrocketing and most of the new housing since 2000 has been for high income residents. And um, of course, that is leaving several, a, a huge portion of the population behind. Um, Black communities are also still concentrated in redlined areas, partially because of these um, systemic policies, systemic racist policies, as well as um, the, the, new, the new housing that is pushing them out. And it has very much become a city of the rich and the poor. Um, poverty for Black residents is 50% higher. And there, as I mentioned, with um, transport and the MBTA and with transit in general, there is a void in Dorchester, Roxbury uh, for 20% of the population, which at this point are unacceptable numbers and definitely require a lot of opportunities and uh, solutions to be addressed. And to go a little bit more into the public health of our city, there is chronic and air pollution and heat related diseases. And um, back in March, 2023, the Boston Globe also had a report on lead and the paint on Tobin Bridge still flaking into the water and affecting neighborhoods and areas around there. And, and Chelsea has always had an historic problem um, in, in that city. So there is just, there's, there's so much to address. There's, there's a lot more to read upon. So I really encourage everyone um, to read the report if you haven't already. And the major takeaway is that 76% of Boston is an environmental justice community. Next slide. 
So that takes us a little bit, we're still in the same section here, um, but that takes us a little bit more into the opportunities where we can tackle climate injustice. So that's, they're very much our opportunities for us all as um, stakeholders within the public and the private sector to commit to investing in mitigation and resilience and prioritize capital and projects to move um, our city forward. And, and as the Climate Progress Report card came out from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Massachusetts in these past couple of weeks, there are plenty of opportunities to partner with the federal and state government to ensure that we are all on board um, as we bring our, our residents along. And I think this is most arguably possibly the most important one to communicate climate justice and to reframe the narrative um, that this is more of an opportunity than it is. I mean, of course, there are several challenges, but I think there are several entry points um, for us to uh, work on and launch projects in. And that takes me to the next slide, which is more um, detailed opportunities for us in the climate justice sector. So these are the six major um, six major points that we make in the report. So the first is to establish goals and a baseline and key performance indicators so that we can really have data to begin tracking where we're beginning and where we're ending. Um, and of course, data runs the world at this point. So it's super important for us to have that um, to, to visualize our progress. And um, targeting investments for vulnerable people, I think this one is a given, um, but in order to, to bring our communities um, to desegregate, to make sure that we are um, putting the right, investing the right resources into our environmental justice communities, we should be targeting them um, for our the communities that need them. And in that same vein, addressing the need for residential retrofits and focusing on equitable workforce um, and workforce development. I know um, very much the these are all recommendations and principles and practices that we are um, recommending through the report that need to be followed and achieved, but a lot of this work has already begun and um, there's a lot of great projects out there focusing on these. Um, and the last two kind of relate to what the GRC is doing and uh, the way we are um, taking uh, we are taking advantage of our membership and um, making sure that we're using the influence that we have to organize climate justice strategies and communicate justice. And again, that takes me into the next slide, which are all of the work streams and initiatives that the Green Ribbon Commission have going on right now and have um, been happening for the past couple of years. But I do want to call your attention in particular to number seven, which is the Climate Justice Network. We The report, as I mentioned, was launched in March of this year. And soon after, we began organizing and launching the Climate Justice Network, um, which is uh, the an, or, like, an organization of all of the GRC, uh, many of the GRC members. And um, they they, we are using the power, the influence, the sheer number and the assets of anchor institutions in Boston to really create a network, a shared knowledge network of sorts um, to recommend climate justice principles and recommendations um, for our members and uh, to carry out for the audiences that they serve. So that's just a little bit about what the report covers. Um, there is so much more. It is, it is a, it's a much longer report than you. Um, you'd think, um, but there's a lot of really great information. So um, I will stop there and I will now turn it over to Professor Ted Landsmark, who will share more about the development in Boston and historic harms through through the work. Well, good afternoon. Um, I want to speak briefly about um, the uh, context of development in Boston uh, based on my uh, prior work uh, in mayoral administrations and my current work with the Boston Planning and Development Agency, um, much of the focus um, on uh, large-scale development uh, in the city goes back to uh, the Flynn administration, which um, took a look at uh, the fact that a very large percentage, uh, nearly uh, half of uh, the city's uh, real estate um, is tax exempt. Um, uh, universities, um, uh, federal and uh, state uh, offices um, occupy a large part of the uh, real estate in Boston that uh, can be used to generate revenues, tax revenues, uh, to pay for uh, public services. 
Um, and as of the uh, time of uh, the Flynn administration and working into the time of the Menino administration, um, the city looked at the range of services that it needed to provide in terms of uh, support for schools and uh, fire support in parks and uh, a range of other public services um, and looked at the one area of the city that uh, was most likely to be able to uh, generate large scale revenues. And that was uh, the Boston waterfront, which at the time um, had been designated, had been uh, uh, used uh, primarily either as um, a railroad yard for abandoned uh, trains or for parking. Um, and the feeling at the time was that um, if large scale commercial development took place um, in that area, there would be no displacement. There would be an opportunity to focus on the kind of real estate development that would generate uh, large revenues from commercial development. Um, and uh, there would be an opportunity to uh, leverage uh, what the um, un underutilized real estate could do to provide for city services uh, across the city. Um, there was negligible discussion at that time of environmental justice, uh, nor was there even a lot of discussion of some of the environmental impacts um, that doing that kind of development uh, would have. Uh, the uh, focus instead was on uh, doing development that would generate large revenues for the city, and that meant focusing on commercial development and uh, doing it in a way that would uh, use that waterfront property as a way of transferring uh, revenues uh, from one portion of the city into the neighborhoods to then support uh, a range of other uh, needed social activities. Um, and so the seaport came into being. Uh, many folks uh, in the planning community and many residents look at that area now and say that it could have been developed uh, differently. Um, and certainly that is the case. Um, but it is also the case that the primary goal of uh, developing uh, that area as it was developed uh, was achieved. That is to say, um, large uh, revenues through uh, tax dollars um, have now uh, flowed from the area into uh, the rest of the city. Um, and it, it can uh, be said that even though uh, issues of environmental justice were not considered uh, in terms of the development of the area itself, um, the uh, development achieved a uh, uh, high bond rating, and uh, at this point, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenues that have flowed into other aspects of the way the city has done its development. It's really only been within the last uh, few years that the city has begun to look at in a uh, hard way uh, the um, uh, implications of that kind of development as those implications relate to environmental justice and the release of uh, a number of reports from uh, the Green Ribbon Commission and from the Boston Foundation and from the state um, and from uh, other agencies has indicated that uh, the environmental impacts have been uh, disproportionately uh, harsh on uh, communities of color. Um, and on uh, lower income communities uh, across the uh, area. And so now, um, at a variety of scales, the focus um, has been on what it is we do to overcome that. And um, I think other speakers will address this as well, but I can say from the uh, perspective of uh, Northeastern, where I'm uh, now a professor, that um, many of our uh, anchor institutions are focusing increasingly on what it is we can do to offset and mitigate um, uh, looking forward the kinds of negative impacts that uh, have taken place because of our uh, prior uh, development practices. There's much more of a focus on uh, workforce development, uh, much more of a focus on uh, bringing institutions uh, together. Uh, to talk about um, uh, uh, microgrids and shared ways of um, uh, directing our energy policy, and much more of a focus coming from the city itself 
uh, in terms of um, the uh, disproportionate uh, negative uh, environmental impacts that have been felt in our communities of color. Um, so I'll stop at that point and uh, move on to uh, the uh, other speakers who can address some of the specifics of environmental justice in the city. Thank you so much, Professor Landsmark. I was obviously very, very valuable information. And as you said, I want to pass it straight off to um, Amari, who will get up his slides here. And then Amari, you can take it from here. Thank you. Good Thanks. afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's always great to, to see Ted Landsmark. It's never great to go after Ted Landsmark. So I'm going to try to do my best uh, in if, if uh, I think what we'll what we'll see, depending on your generation, this is either the Reader's Digest, uh, the Cliff Notes, or the TikTok of the earlier report that we put in the link, and just really to continue the conversation that uh, Professor Landsmark talked about. Next slide, please. And so, to, to frame these injury areas of community, and when we think about racial equity, um, we understand that racism has caused several injury areas that impact. Uh, historically marginalized communities disproportionately. Uh, those areas are culture, symbols, and personhood. And so when you think about the embrace, a monument in a city like Boston, full of monuments, uh, the embrace is one of the things that addresses culture, symbols, and personhood. Uh, other injury areas include criminal legal justice systems, transportation, housing, education, income, and wealth, and uh, last but not least, climate and resiliency. Next slide, please. I just want to toggle back uh, to, to our history and, and to the embrace. Uh, in a couple of years, we'll be celebrating the anniversary of the 1965 Freedom Rally, which was the largest civil rights uh, march in New England. Uh, 22,000 people marched uh, with Dr. King from Carter Playground to the Parkman Bandstand, steps from the embrace. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the issues that they marched for included, and, and I think if you've asked anyone in any big city, uh, what what would be issues that they would say are top of mind? Uh, in 1965, the issues that were top of mind in those days were education, housing, poverty, and social justice. So uh, a lot of things have changed since 1965, and a lot of things have remained the same. Uh, next slide, please. And so just to give you a, a sense of what we mean by culture symbols and, and personhood uh, among the other uh, injury areas, uh, it, it is considering and thinking about the absence of culture and symbols that help in the self-determination of people. And so when we think about this new neighborhood, uh, the seaport, uh, not only were there implications of industry and climate not considered when building that, uh, that new neighborhood, uh, there were also opportunities and, and in opportunities where we didn't quite capture um, building a new, new neighborhood that considered the culture, symbols, and personhood of communities of color and other communities uh, in, in that neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. I think coinciding with those eight injury areas, and I think, you know, uh, uh, Professor Landmark touched on this, is uh, a consideration of spatial justice. And that's the relationship between social justice and space. Uh, the idea that the geography of the space plays as much a role um, as the vibrancy of the space uh, and the idea of historic wrongs being um, transpiring as a result of space uh, is something that we consider one of the, the injury areas. And so we're, many of us have listened to recently uh, the podcast of the Big Dig and the displacement of those communities uh, and, and the result of those neighborhoods being uh, disseminated, uh, that is also a spatial justice issue. And so um, that is one of the things that we consider when we think about these eight injury areas in totality. Uh, next slide, please. And so what's the intersection of those eight injury areas and space? And so third space is, I think, one of the ways that we consider the, the intersection of all eight of those injury areas, particularly uh, climate and resiliency. Uh, first space is real space. And so that's the physical environment, people's homes, their workspace, uh, the real environment. Uh, second space is how people see themselves in the space. 
Uh, and so you oftentimes hear it in higher education, for example, where uh, young people go to higher education institutions and they feel like they don't belong, or people go into neighborhoods where nothing has happened to them, but they can't imagine themselves being in here. Or we see development in new neighborhoods uh, and the residents of those neighborhoods see those new buildings, see those new spaces, and despite that, you know, nothing has happened to them, uh, in, in reality, they can't see themselves belonging to that space. Uh, and so third space is the intersection between that the built environment and people's imagination and their feeling of belonging in that space. And so when we think about this, the role of climate and resiliency, I think third space is also where this plays out. Uh, people's reality in their lived space uh, and their imagination of what they deserve, what they are missing in the climate space, um, where it plays out is in the third space. Next slide, please. And so th this is some of the areas when we think about uh, building third space, uh, thinking about resiliency, thinking about climate, thinking about spatial justice, uh, the equitable distribution of resources and services, uh, inclusion and accessibility, uh, redressing historic harms, participating in public participation in urban planning, uh, sustainable and resilient development, and lastly, addressing spatial segregation uh, is what we also consider as a strategy and addressing those historic harms, but in particularly climate and resiliency. Next slide, please. And so what does this have to do with today? And I think, you know, many of us, uh, several folks from Embrace, and I know several of our friends are currently at the State House. Uh, testifying for this uh, new potential uh, reparations task force that is happening at the state level. Uh, and so some of the, some of us frame the moment in time we're having as it pertains to racial equity uh, as part of this third reconstruction. The first reconstruction happened post-Civil War, and so many of us have read about this uh, post-Civil War. That was one of the largest um, times that formerly enslaved people and free Black people were elected into um, state and federal government. Uh, the second reconstruction occurred uh, during the civil rights era where, era where you saw uh, large swaths of legislation being passed uh, to right the wrongs, to, to produce justice situations. And, and the third reconstruction where we're seeing a combination of new legislation, uh, the emergence of civic and elected leaders, uh, and, a, and a stronger emphasis on racial and social justice. And next slide, please. And so not to give a reparations class, uh, but reparations is an opportunity where when we talk about redressing the injury areas, uh, reparations is where those, uh, those injury areas where the redress would occur. Uh, and so these are just, I won't read them, but these are just some definitions of what reparations means. And so many people have conversations about reparations for who? And so are we talking about reparations for formerly enslaved folks or ancestors of formerly enslaved folks? Or are we talking about reparations for historically marginalized communities? And in some cases, when you think about redlining, when you think about climate injustice in the city of Boston in, in, in ways that they were state sanctioned, uh, folks who lived in those areas where they were marginalized as a result of those things would be eligible for reparations in some conversations. Uh, next slide, please. So Darity and Mullen create a frame in which some of us are having conversations about those eight injury areas. Uh, and, and if you get nothing else from, from this, this short brief explanation, uh, consider this term ARC, acknowledgement, redress, and closure. And so when we think about advancing policy, when we think about uh, advancing new legislation, when we think about advancing new values, ARC is a frame that many of us use not only to discuss reparations, but to discuss uh, advancement and healing uh, in the justice space. Uh, so in, in order for us to redress a challenge, we have to acknowledge that the challenge exists. And my, my quick joking analogy is that, you know, if you, you're in a partnership and you get into an argument with your partner uh, and you know that they like uh, milk chocolate, uh, the first time you could come back and bring the milk chocolate and you can, you know, you guys might um, forget about the argument because you come back and you bring in the thing that they like and you forget about you have have you ha the argument that you had. The second time you might get in an argument and you might bring back the milk chocolate and you might forget about the argument you had. You do it a third time, the next thing you know, you're going to be sleeping on the couch. And oftentimes we, we address challenges in the same way. 
instead of addressing and acknowledging how these challenges occur, we create uh, legislation and policies that don't acknowledge the challenge in the first place. We immediately go to redress and then hopefully trying to get to closure. And as we know, it creates a cycle where we, we never quite uh, address the challenge and the injured party never gets heard or acknowledged. And I think this is just a new way of thinking about um, racial justice and healing work. Uh, next slide, please. And so as, as you know, there's two uh, important legislation uh, around reparations, work around reparations that are occurring. Uh, in 2022, Mayor Wu signed an ordinance around reparations uh, led by councilors Fernandez Anderson, Worrell, and Mejia. Um, that uh, local reparations on the citywide level is still going on. Right now, they're in the research uh, phase of that. Uh, and today, recently, today, there is testimony going on around Senate Bill 1053 brought to us by Senators Miranda, Edwards, Lewis, Doom, and others to study reparations on the Massachusetts level. And this is really for us to understand the impact of those eight injury areas and also including uh, climate and resiliency or the lack thereof as an injury area for marginalized communities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that's my time. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Chief White Hammond. Thank you so much, Amari. Um, I uh, am thankful to be in this work with you and also um, Ted Landsmark, who has uh, been carrying the torch on so many issues for quite a while. And I really thank both of you for um, setting the stage and to Azanta also, who's been moving this forward and faithfully working on this um, really as, as the person most at the helm of the uh, GRC or work around this. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about where we are and sort of um, you've, you've gotten a sort of background of how we've gotten to this place. Um, I, I take this moment to sort of ground myself because one of the core um, ideas within the report is that we do need to change the narrative. And so I want to, to challenge um, some of the narrative that I think we see coming out of uh, the environmental movement sometime, which is that climate change is about saving the planet. And I want to be really clear um, that the planet is going to be all right. Now she's experiencing a lot of loss. Um, and there is a lot of damage being done, but the climate, uh, the planet has gone through many phases in her development from the times that we were not even around and there was lots more uh, ice, there were ice ages and there was times where there was a lot of heat and the planet has managed to survive, to morph, um, to adapt and to move forward. What we are really talking about is saving ourselves because we have as a human, as human beings, we have a limit to how hot we can be <laughs> before it becomes impossible for us to live. And I, I think the other layer to that is that um, in many ways, we have planned our world, our roads, our buildings, many of our statutes and our pro approaches based on a stable climate. And if that changes to, uh, an extent uh, too great, there comes a point in which our world falls apart. And so I just wanna be really clear that it, our narrative is not about whether or not the earth can survive. Um, I, I don't wanna minimize the deep harm we are causing um, to other species, to our waterways, but the reality is that they will continue to exist. And the question is, is at some point, if mama earth is gonna say, you know what, one of my kids doesn't know how to act, and I got to put them out. And so the question of whether or not we will work um, for justice and whether we will change the way we live is the question at the heart of this conversation. I grew up here in Boston, um, and so many of the conversations and the things being described around redlining and many of the other pieces that we've already lifted up are things that I've lived with. I remember I grew up in Roxbury. As long as I can remember, Roxbury was a predominantly black neighborhood. And I remember going to sing at a uh, nursing home in, in Brookline and mentioned that I was from Roxbury. And this woman said, well, what part of Roxbury? And I remember saying in the back of my head, how you're not gonna know. 
when I told her that I lived on Wombeck Street, and she said, around the corner from Elm Hill. And that was the first time that I knew. And she then told me she had grown up there and other people in the room. And they were mostly Jewish um, elderly folk who had previously lived, lived in Roxbury. And that was the moment at which I took it upon myself to begin understanding how did my family end up here? Who was here before? What were the policies and practices that led to that shift? What were the resources that were here before that are not here now? Um, what are all the pieces of history um, that uh, led to the reality I had experienced, particularly in the 90s, growing up in one of the worst um, times in terms of drug addiction and violence in our city's history and quite frankly, around the world. I lived with the sort of major shift in incarceration that happened in the 80s and 90s. And so I say that because um, I don't believe climate change is separate from all of the other justice issues um, that we deal with. And um, the way I try to approach it and the way that we're trying to um, lead at the city is to not see the environment as something over here and all of the other racial and economic justice issues as separate, but to know that the policies that created our climate crisis are the same policies in many instances that created our racial justice crises and created our economic justice crises. And so we have to address this challenge in a way that really looks holistically at the cascading sets of problems that we see. We talk about climate as a threat multiplier. It takes anything that is a challenge already and makes it even worse. And in many instances, it takes communities that have done the least to contribute to the climate crisis are the ones, unfortunately, that are most impacted. I think about the idea that Harriet Tubman, the land that she grew up in and the place where she um, was actively moving and trying to free people from slavery was Dorchester County, Maryland. And there are a number of AME churches there. I'm in, as was mentioned, I'm in the AME church that are sinking because they are in the low lying areas. Those places that are easily floodable and those places that have, um, are experiencing great amounts of risk because of sea level rise and inland flooding. And so I just wanna push us to, to see that climate is an existential threat, but one that is connected to all the other justice issues about which we care. I also wanna note that not all of the inequitable policies we face are in the far off past. One of the things that we're looking at here at the uh, Environment Department, I'm gonna talk about three policies that we have and really help us to see how they're connected in the ways that we're trying to, to innovate. Um, there is a major challenge with many of our communities having a disproportionate energy burden. Many of us are right now in the play, place where it's getting colder. And unfortunately too many families we know have to choose between how much they're gonna spend on food and how much they're gonna spend on their energy bills. In the 90s, there was a bill that was passed in the legislature. And I will say it was, it had good intentions at the beginning. We, we fought for what they called competitive electric supply. And the idea was that if you had more companies coming in and, and able to sell you your electric supply, that they would lower the prices and it would mean that you would have more competitive rates for everyone. The reality has been the exact opposite. The attorney general's office has found that more than half a billion dollars has been paid by people to these predatory electric suppliers that are charging rates significantly higher than the standard rate that people would pay on um, Eversource's basic energy. Now I'll talk a little bit about, we have an even better rate than the city of Boston, but we'll get to that in a quick, quest, in a quick section, second. And many of these predatory companies, you know who they go after? The same communities where we saw the predatory mortgage lenders. And so in 2021, we found that 42% of residents in Dorchester were on these predatory electric supply companies. And just to give you a sense of what that means, the uh, rate currently in Boston if you had 100% renewable energy through the city's program is 14 cents a kilowatt hour. If you were, uh, if you're on Eversource, I believe the rate is 17 cents a kilowatt hour. And on these predatory suppliers, we are finding people paying up to 60 cents a kilowatt hour. We're talking about bills that can be hundreds of dollars over what people would be paying, even if they were just on the basic electrics supply. And those companies are targeting seniors, people of color, 
and people who don't speak English as their first language, most pointedly, they're also now starting to go after students. Um, and so 42% of Dorchester is on these horrible contracts, 45% of Roxbury, 43% of Mattapan, 36% in East Boston, Hyde Park 35. I mean, you can see the same exact communities that have been underinvested in and that have been targeted in the past are being targeted again with electricity um, bills that they cannot ex uh, afford. And so this is not just something of the past. This is right now. We have been testifying at the State House. We invite you to consider joining us. Um, but it's not just about protesting what isn't working. It's also about making sure that we're creating alternatives. I was really proud to be part of um, the Boston Community Choice Electricity, it's, which is a program that was created by the city with residents. At that time, I was a resident um, arguing. I'm still a resident, but I, I wasn't in this role. Um, um, trying to create a program that would bring higher amounts of renewable electricity at a more affordable price to every single Boston resident. So if you're a resident of Boston, you are eligible for this. The standard rate brings you 39% renewable power, power, which is only um, in, in Eversource would be 24%. And you also can join at what we call the optional green 100, which uh, for 17, six a kilowatt hour starting in January, you would be provide a fully renewable electricity. And so the, the big piece here is not, not just that the energy is greener, but by taking out the profit motive and having the city being the one that makes the purchase, we're able to bring more green energy to people at a lower price. The work of reversing these harms is not just about talking about them, but creating real solutions that's paying attention to how do we make sure that everybody benefits from the green economy. And in many instances, unfortunately, only those who are in the know and only those who have the resources are often benefiting from um, a lot of the green programs that we're creating. But we're really trying to make it so that you don't have to work hard. You don't have to you know, look up five different things and have the right people and have extra money to be able to participate in being green. It should be the default that everyone gets to be green and that everyone gets to save money while they're doing it. So energy is one place where we see some of those harms continuing. Another place where we see a lot of that harm continuing is around um, the ways that our buildings are set up. About 70% of our emissions in the city of Boston really come from our building stock. Um, and that means that um, if we want to not contribute to worse climate change, we also have to look at what we can do to decarbonize. And the question is, how do we decarbonize in a way that's equitable? We have an, a policy called BIRDO, the Building Emissions uh, Reduction and Decarbonization Ordinance. Um, it started with disclosure and now we're really focusing on actually decarbonizing. And it asks buildings over 20,000 square feet or apartment buildings of greater than 15 units uh, to really get focused on decarbonizing, decarbonizing the building because we're living already with the reality of climate change. Our seas are already rising. I don't know how many of you live. I know Amara, you live in Hyde Park. So I know you all have heat but y'all not that close to the water. But I live in Dorchester, um, right near Morrissey. And we see, even on regular high tides, the water come up over the road. I have, sometimes I'm on the emergency uh, management call and we're, we're tracking what the next storm is gonna bring in terms of how much surge is that gonna bring. We recognize that, unfortunately, if Hurricane Sandy, had just come at a different time of, of day for Boston, we would have had a very, very markedly different experience than we did. It is only because it came closer to low tide that we actually were not hit um, nearly as bad as, uh, as uh, New York was. And so really looking at how do we decarbonize our buildings in a way that's fair and equitable. And one of the ways we do that is we start with those buildings that on the whole have done the best. We've asked larger buildings to take the lead. We don't think it makes sense to ask residents to get started. Um, and so mostly the buildings that are impacted by, by Birdo are the larger buildings. But we recognize that even in some instances, there are larger buildings where low-income folks are living and thriving, and we need to pay attention to that. And so what we've created is a setup where if you are a large building and you do not meet your decarbonization targets, and I can answer more, I'm running out of time, so I don't. I want to be careful not to go too long and too deep in the details, but if you want to go in the details, we definitely can. 
But we basically ask them if they don't make their uh, decarbonization schedule, they can contribute to what we call an alternative compliance payment. And that money goes into a equitable decarbonization fund. That fund is about making sure that our affordable housing buildings, some of our nonprofits, um, some of our houses of worship that may not be as well resourced, maybe a large building, but are not as well resourced, have opportunities to decarbonize um, and they have the financial support they need. And so it is a bit of asking those buildings and those companies that have done well, that have been um, benefiting from this boom in Boston to make sure that everybody has what they need to decarbonize and move along. Uh, we believe that decarbonization is good, not just because we're gonna help with our carbon footprint, that is the main reason, but also because it is likely that energy prices will continue to rise as it gets more and more expensive. We also wanna make sure that people take the steps right now to make sure that our city um, can survive what we think are gonna be are likely continually rising energy costs. So that's an, an area again, where um, we ask those who have the most to do the most, and we've created a board um, that is made up of residents, mostly appointed by com uh, community-based organizations. Two thirds of the board are people nominated by community-based organizations to make the decisions about where those resources should go, when people should be given um, a break and when they've really tried and they, and they have some challenges. And I will say, we've heard some trepidation from the business community and some of the larger um, folks that are, are a little concerned about what it means to be accountable to our environmental justice communities. But we really believe that's the kind of way we have to do our climate policy if we're really serious about turning this cli climate crisis around and about not, make, not putting the greatest burden on the people that have already been burdened more than enough. And finally, we have uh, a push around uh, our heat and tree canopy. Um, again, the city, if you look at the city overall, we have a 27% tree canopy, that's our average, but you will not be surprised to know that it is not distributed evenly across the city. We have some neighborhoods that have much higher levels of tree canopy and other neighborhoods with much less. And there are real impacts to that. We did a heat study. Um, you can go look up the Boston Heat uh, report. You can also go look up the urban forest plan. Both of them will give you some of the statistics. Um, but it, it really, uh, when you see it visually uh, and the reality that, for instance, Chinatown, which is our hottest neighborhood in the city of Boston, at night, the difference in temperature between Chinatown and West Roxbury can be as high as 12 degrees. Think about that. 12 degrees difference. That's the difference between it being 80 degrees and comfortable and excited and you wanna wear that cute outfit and it being 90 degrees and you're saying, I don't know if I even wanna go to this thing, it's too hot to do anything, right? And often that means that some of our older buildings where there isn't AC, where the power, for instance, or electricity may not even be strong enough to run good AC units, and unfortunately, too often, elderly folks, uh, low-income folks who do not have other options are living in these, these uh, older housing units, and they're directly impacted. Many people think of climate change, and they think of the big hurricanes and the sea level rise, and all of those are huge. But what we know is many more people die from heat. They die silently in their bed. They die um, from heat stroke outside because they have to go to work. They can't afford to take a day off. They die because they have some other um, illness, diabetes, hypertension, um, heart disease that is triggered by that heat, asthma, uh, neighborhoods where people have already lived with lots of pollution. And so we're really looking at how do we do our uh, planting of trees, not equally across the city, but to get to equity across the city. How do we say, let's look at those neighborhoods where we haven't done enough planting in the past and let's do the majority of our planting there. What's been really exciting, and we can talk about how we uh, are moving that, but um, the thing that I think brings me the greatest joy of all the things I've had the opportunity to work on since being in 
um, in this office. I've loved working on Birdo. We've gotten national um, recognition from the White House and beyond about the fact that we embedded equity into the way we were doing our build, building decarbonization, um, the release of the heat plan, working on planting trees. But one of the things that's been most exciting about this is to ask the question, how do we make sure that the interventions we make on this are gonna create lots of jobs? They're gonna create jobs at the federal, the local, in businesses, all around. Um, there are people needed to plant trees. There are people needed to um, change over from oil to uh, heat pumps. There, all of these are jobs and they can be good paying jobs. But what's really important is we make sure that folks that live in environmental justice neighborhoods have not just equal, but equitable, which would mean even more access to this jo these jobs than other communities who have had um, more information and more access in the past. And so one of the things we started in 2021, um, I went to uh, Philadelphia with then Councilor Bach, she's now running the BHA and working at a lot of the, the decarbonization work that we're doing there. Um, we went to Philadelphia to look at a program called Power Core. Um, it was started there by Mayor Nutter and its big focus on, was on how to bring young people, young adults, 18 to 30, from some of Philly's uh, more marginalized neighborhoods into the green economy, with a heavy focus on making sure um, that folks who are returning citizens who had been previously incarcerated or caught up in the criminal justice system had an opportunity to get the kinds of jobs that would allow them to not have to turn back into some of the uh, practices that might have um, sent them to prison in the first place. And so um, I, I literally, a couple minutes ago during this, I had to tell them, I can't talk right now, but they're just texting me about the graduation for the third uh, class. We've, um, our first cohort had about 30 participants, 21 of them graduated and were all successfully placed in jobs. Um, they represented five Boston neighborhoods, 54% from Dorchester, 12% from Roxbury, 8% from Mattapan, 12% from Roslindale, and 4% for Hyde Park. We're really looking at, you, I, you mentioned, you heard those places that I heard, I said were being targeted by, um, by uh, predatory electric suppliers. You've heard me talk about which neighborhoods have been impacted by a lack of tree canopy. We're trying to make sure that, that those same neighborhoods and communities are at the forefront of entering the green jobs workforce. Most of them trained around uh, urban forestry. In our second tier, we added not just urban forestry, but building automated systems. And that's basically teaching people how to use and monitor the fancy systems that all of our buildings are having to put in in order to comply with Birdo. We know that in order to match Birdo, there are going to be a lot of jobs created around building management and making sure that they are um, meet, meeting their emissions and energy targets. And so we created a track in Power Core so that the young folks from our communities, many of whom are from neighborhoods where a lot of us are getting gentrified out, are able to get the kinds of jobs downtown in their neighborhoods to be part of the climate solution. Um, and so the current cohort has 43 participants, um, again, in urban forestry and building automated systems. There's 77% Black and 23% Latinx, 35% identified as female, which is a huge growth from where we were at the beginning. We're truly trying to make sure um, that, these, that the diversification is not just around race, but also gender. Um, and the average age of our power core, core, um, cohort is 23. Many of them are folks who come out of Boston public schools or maybe didn't and got went back and got their GED, um, but who need a pathway to the kinds of jobs um, that really are gonna, that you can raise a family on, that you can make a down payment on a house on, that you're not living paycheck to paycheck, but that you can really um, have some level of security and participate in the radical transformation that we need. This climate crisis is also an opportunity. I've talked about the jobs and that's a huge piece of it. But in reality, we have to radically transform our world and make it different. And the only way to do that is a major shift in our economy. I tell people all the time that I do ecological justice work. And that's because eco means home. And ecology is one of the few disciplines that doesn't look at things and break them down to their smallest piece, but really looks at, um, how things are in relationship with each other. We got into this mess because of disordered and unequal relationships. And we only 
get out of this. We only deserve to get out of it. If we start changing the way we distribute our resources, if we start changing the ways that we value people's lives, and we really focus on creating the kind of world where all of us can live and thrive. So really excited to go into the question section. There's just a few of the things we're trying to do with the city to look at that history and make a new future together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Mariama. And I think the biggest takeaway from everyone's presentations is that justice is very much intersectional across the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Uh, Yes, so justice is uh, intersectional and, and so much of it has, we, we won't be able to move forward without the past and the past also um, can't really hold us because we have so many opportunities to look forward to. So um, I really appreciate everyone's time and presentations. I do have a lot of questions to ask you all. So we will try to fit everything in. And uh, for those of you who have been submitting questions, thank you so much. Feel free to leave them in the chat. Um, and I do wanna start off um, Reverend Mariama with just something that um you know you were you were speaking about and um you know so, like with your position in the city i think there are so so many um you were mentioning significant policy barriers that uh there are to make to to make needed investments in climate and targeting the benefit of those benefits um to historically marginalized populations in the neighborhoods in boston that are environmental justice mm -hmm. communities um are there ways that you believe in which Boston's private sector can lend its political clout to eliminating some of these policy barriers that you were talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, there's a few things, right? So one of the things I'll say is um, in, in this role, I've, I've always, you know, remained in conversation with folks at the state. And I will say that over this last year, the tenor and the, um, collaborative nature of those conversations has, has shifted significantly. So I think there are real opportunities for greater alignment between um, municipal and state policies. And I think that there are roles at, for the private sector and everyday citizens to really advocate for the ways that we come into greater levels of alignment. So that will be one. The second is I think the business community all almost all of them are impacted by Berta, right? And I think that, you know, I, I'm not I'm not upset that people have concerns and they do, right? But there is a real opportunity for us to partner because we know we need to decarbonize. That's a given. We've all said it. We all said we're going to get there by 2050. And sometimes we find a lot of uh, consternation when we start actually doing things. And so I'm not saying folks cannot raise their concerns. I think they should. I, I do think we still would like them to be partners, recognizing this is something we all have to do. And so let's figure out how to do it collaboratively. Um, I will lift up, as I mentioned, that one of the things that Power Core does is train young folk to be able to support. We heard from businesses that, you know, we were asking them to do things and they needed a workforce that actually knew how to do it. So I said, no worries. We want to help you build that workforce. And um, that's one of the reasons that we created that track with Empower Core. And I will say there are a number of businesses that actually have been hiring, um, starting off with allowing um, Power Core grads to start there in an internship. And what the agreement has been is if they do well in that internship, you will hire them. And A Better City, which has you know, been a real like partner with some of the business community and a lot of the real estate community, helped us. They reached out to people that were already in their network and said, we need you to create these internships. And so we've got young folks from Power Core working at um, Brigham and Women's. Uh, BXP has, I'm taking, I think, more than one intern across their properties. Um, the Fed has taken on um, folks. Boston City Hall has two folks. So, I mean, that, that way in which we can work together to say, if we need a new workforce, let's make sure we make it as a pathway for Boston residents who've been locked out. And let's not just give people skills and a piece of paper. I'm not interested in anybody's certifications. I'm interested in jobs. And so we've been able, and it was it was a little bit of a negotiation, right? People were like, oh, you know, we'll take the, and we said, no, 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 we need you to guarantee a job at the other end. And many um, folks did step up. And I think that there that's 
you know, in lots of things from that to, to the kind of climate resilience we need along our waterfront and inland, all of those pieces, we really do need to partner. The city can't do it by itself. Um, and so we need people to come as willing partners. I'm not saying we aren't open to critique, but I think if we come to the table again with the recognition, we don't have any other choice but to do this. We gotta work together. I think there are ways we can build uh, opportunities together and we are already. Um, I just think we need to keep growing that that uh, uh, impetus as we keep moving along. I appreciate that. And uh, Professor Landsmark and Mari, I wanna give you the chance to answer the question as well about any policy investments that you believe would, would be needed from the private sector um, from your point of view, and then we can move on to another question. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying that um, uh, the private sector um, has the ability to pass on some of the um, uh, usually almost inevitable um, uh, uh, cost increases uh, that come with addressing some of these issues to their tenants. Um, th that's not possible uh, in terms of trying to achieve um, uh, environmental justice and equity um, when uh, the people who are most negatively impacted uh, can't assume additional costs. Um, so, yes, we have looked at uh, work that's going on in other cities uh, around the country, Seattle, for example, um, where uh, there have been efforts made to share uh, the added cost burdens more equitably uh, across the um, uh, public and private sectors. Um, I think the um, other issue that has to be dealt with is that Boston can't deal with this issue alone. Uh, this is uh, clearly a regional issue. Uh, dealing with uh, a waterfront, for example, um, doesn't just cover Dorchester and East Boston. It uh, covers the entire coastline uh, up the Revere down to Quincy. Um, and uh, that's an area where uh, state action is necessary in order to help bring the various municipalities together um, around uh, shared planning. Uh, we've done some shared planning in the past, not always as successfully as we uh, should have in planning our airports and transportation systems. Um, and now's a moment when clearly um, state action and new leadership uh, coming out of the state house um, it can bring people together uh, to talk about um, how we can uh, act uh, collaboratively before uh, we have uh, the kind of environmental disasters that have taken place around the country. Um, if we had been hit with a major storm um, that uh, devastated a number of communities, everyone would be willing to talk to each other. Uh, now we have the opportunity to be able to have those conversations about collaborative work before that kind of catastrophe takes place. And uh, this is a moment when uh, that kind of collaboration needs to uh, be initiated. And um, Amar, do you want, do you have anything to add or? I, I don't. This is one of the one of the moments where you're preaching to the choir. All I got to all I got to say is amen to to what what my uh, beloved colleagues and friends have said. Absolutely. Um, okay, I know we are uh, we ha we're getting some questions in the chat, so I'm gonna move into some audience cues. Um, so we did receive one ag again for Reverend Mariama. Um, how will the city incorporate the report's findings in into its policies, and do you have any concrete examples of the report's impact? I mean, we have we have looked at the report. I think many of the things that the report highlights are things that also were highlighted in some of the other reports that we've done recently. So I think I, I appreciate that it puts it all in one place. Um, I think, so you might wanna look at, for instance, our urban forest plan or our uh, heat plan. Both of them actually look at the, the history of redlining and how it's created um, the challenges that we're in. So I think the report tries to give a, a large overview. We have looked at some of those same things and often try to hone in on specific issues that we are working on and how we're going to address them. So yeah, I, I would say there's uh, a lot of alignment between 
what is lifted up in the report and um, some of the policy areas that we sort of looked at and, and, and been taking uh, action on. Absolutely. Um, so another question we received um, is from an equity perspective, um, if owners fall a bit short of Birdo goals, how do you see investing in applicable offsets versus alternative compliance payments? Yeah, I mean, I think I want to be careful. We are in the midst of the uh, Birdo uh, regulations process, so I'm not going to I'm going to be very careful about speaking out of term, but I'll talk from the big picture perspective. I think that um, what I would say is I know that people are going to be looking at RECs and uh, looking at what kind of options they are. And I think the thing I would say is I would use the same lens that we are using at the city as we also look at how we bring more renewable energy and how we decarbonize our own electric supply and our, our own buildings. You know, I think we've been really trying to look at how do we um, how do we support things that are what we call truly additional, i.e. not just buying into things that already exist, but how do we use our resources to spur new things to happen that wouldn't naturally have just happened on their own. Um, and so we're doing things like looking at how to buy into um, shared solar as much as we can, like in the city of Boston, but also uh, sticking in the state. Uh, I'm not saying we have any problem investing in the Midwest. I think that's great. Um, I, I'm glad that um, a lot of people don't know, like Texas has some of the largest amount of wind <laughs> going on. And I don't think there's a negative, negative piece to it, but you can't actually be sure that it's going to an environmental justice community. And so I've really been looking at it, even like, where are there opportunities to invest in solar? If we're going to go beyond Massachusetts, how are we looking at tribal communities that are, there are a number of Native American tribes that are also um, looking at creating solar farms in their communities. I think, again, the question is, how do we use the resources that we are in receiving and using and spending to decarbonize to lift up those communities that are mo have been most negatively impacted? That's how we're looking at our own investments here. Um, we are constantly trying to um, balance between the maximum amount of green energy, renewable energy, and asking the questions, are there ways to ensure that the jobs can go to local people? Are there ways to ensure that this um, will repair harms in communities, for instance, that had to have coal fire power plants for years and they have asthma as a result of it, right? So I think the, the question is, how do you get more intentional in the way you're spending your dollars to make sure that there's justice embedded in it? Um, and I'm not saying that it's always easy or straightforward. You usually have to sign longer contracts. You can't do it just for a year or two, right? But um, we we believe that that's worthwhile. Um, and I do think we are trying to find a way um, that when people are serious about multiple of our values, they get some level of credit for that in the burden process. And I would say that's why it's exciting that we have folks from environmental justice communities that are on that um, community review board, because I think that um, if folks have really made the effort to bring justice in the way they're doing their decarbonization, I'd be inclined to believe the community review board would uh, take that into account. I can't speak for them, they're an independent body. I'm just, uh, but I'm, I, I do know that it's been, there have been robust discussions in the community engagement process around jobs, around supporting low-income residents, around making sure that the Green Revolution benefits local communities, environmental justice communities. And if buildings and building owners are taking that seriously, they certainly should be lifting that up because I do think that that's something that the review board is gonna care about. Do you, and, and not to, one more question for you, not to linger, but yeah. um, have us for the city in particular have key performance indicators and recommendations for the measurements on these goals for climate justice and how institutions can focus on them? You know, that, that's a good question. And that's something we should consider putting out because I do know what we are looking at, um, but I'm not sure that I could say that they're written up like, here's how we rate this and this is how we rate that. Um, we do look at where is the energy being um, created? What are, uh, who's benefiting from it? Is it a large solar farm? For instance, we don't want large solar farms that cut down trees to put up solar panels. Not feeling it. Right. And we do know that it takes more money and more resources to put um, solar farms, for instance, in densely 
uh, you know, more densely populated urban areas. So that would be the kind of thing that we would look at if it was a lot of shared solar in a urban area. We know the we know the sort of breakdown of what that takes and might consider that at a premium, especially if it's our own community, um, over something where we think uh, they might've just thrown up a bunch of panels and it's not clear that anybody else is, is benefiting from it. So I think, um, but that's a challenge. Maybe we could um, at minimum put out some of the things that we're having internal conversations about. It might not you know, be a full rating system, but at least um, it might give folks something to work from. Absolutely. You know, that, that's an area um, where uh, the issue is really one of accountability. Um, how, how do we uh, hold ourselves accountable uh, for the metrics um, that uh, would indicate that we're actually making some progress in these areas? And uh, every one of the uh, universities um, in our area uh, has people who are working on developing uh, those kinds of metrics. They're using engineering standards. They're uh, using artificial intelligence um, uh, they're uh, using uh, performance modeling standards that are coming out of uh, both design and engineering and business schools. Um, and it may be um, uh, an appropriate moment for uh, the city, the BPDA, uh, uh, the Green Ribbon Commission to convene um, many of the uh, scholars and experts within our universities who've been uh, working on these fields for a while um, to uh, help develop uh, a, a accountability standards and metrics um, that would uh, enable us to hold ourselves uh, accountable for whether the interventions we're making are actually working. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think that kind of goes into another one of the participant questions. Um, there are a lot of higher ed institutions in Boston and, and people present here um, listening. And I think that I, the academics and the research have one role in um, climate justice in Boston. Do you have specifically, Professor Landsmark, any other recommendations um, for higher ed institutions across across Boston and the role they should play and maybe even how best to engage the amount of students that we have in, here in Boston? Well, for starters, uh, universities are uh, not just uh, centers of research and teaching. We're also major corporate entities. We're uh, stakeholders within the city. We employ thousands and thousands of people within the region and uh, within the city itself. Um, and uh, I know that uh, most of us um, have established um, uh, accountability mechanisms within ourselves to take a hard look um, at the uh, impacts that we're having and the carbon footprints that we have um, uh, on uh, our uh, local communities. Uh, at Northeastern, there's uh, a, a climate hub, for example, that is now uh, looking at us as a corporate entity, as an energy user, as um, a uh, possible model for developing um, and utilizing standards around resilience and sustainability and uh, appropriate energy use. Um, and uh, to the extent that we're sharing information in that regard, um, and also using our educational capacity to uh, engage in workforce development, working with our local high schools and our community colleges, and some of the smaller colleges that may not have the uh, kinds of resources we have, um, we can begin to really have an impact um, as corporate entities, as well as uh, uh, research centers. The other thing is um, that um, we have platforms to uh, raise questions as among our students and faculty um, as to how we can be better uh, as corporate students. Uh, we find ourselves, for example, beginning to ask our students uh, why they're using ride sharing uh, Uber and Lyft, for example, rather than using public transportation uh, to get around town. We're uh, beginning to ask ourselves what the alternative forms of transportation uh, we can and should be working with uh, to uh, engage our students, not only um, as people who are concerned about their own futures and uh, carbon footprints, but um, also as advocates for current uses 
um, and uh, current policies and practices uh, that well, we as universities need to uh, implement. Uh, unlike a lot of private sector corporations, uh, we don't come and go. We're here. Uh, we're heavily invested in the city's real estate. Um, and we do get tax exemptions uh, for uh, uh, portions of our real estate uh, uh, assets. And uh, I think that that uh, creates for us the obligation of uh, being uh, responsible corporate citizens. Yeah, I, I agree. I actually just wrote a paper on this for my grad school class on how to use um how to encourage students and freshman students in particular to bike more in in the in the city and on campus um and the huge fun fact the huge um barrier for a lot of students is time um because they just feel like biking and that there's just like a sense that cars will get people their destinations must be much faster which as we all know is not necessarily true but. well yes i think we should challenge some students to do an analysis because i actually think it's probably not true yeah, it's probably and universities could do things like um, make their campuses more bike friendly as opposed to car friendly, in which case, if you cut down the amount of time it takes. As I, so I went to school in the West Coast and people who got cars and I did, I got a car my senior year and realized it was saving me no time because mm -hmm. I never got into a bike jam. I definitely got into a traffic jam. And so I think really think about um, how do we, and I think it's hard. I mean, Northeastern is, is a, you know, urban campus. My campus was out in the middle of Palo Alto. And so they had a lot of land and a lot more like control over it. But I do think, how do we make it, if you make it easier and cheaper for people to do things, it's amazing what they will do. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I found. But I bet you there's some <laughs> students out there that could do a whole report about it and as part of a class, sell it to other students or also, you know, have make a uh, pitch to the university about things that they could be doing to make it a more bike friendly campus. Yeah, there's definitely a huge role for every member at every higher ed, higher, higher ed institution in Boston. Um, and Amari, I do want to give you um, a question. I have a question for I, you. I feel like I'm in the front row seat here in this conversation, so I, I don't have to say anything because usually I, I feel like I do a lot of the talking, so this has been great. <laughs> I do have one for you in ah. particular, um, and since you, you very much focused on spatial justice in your presentation, how would you recommend applying your um, the, the concept of spatial justice on a practical basis as you start to think about some of the climate-related changes that we need to make here, um, especially like for example, development around Nubian Square or like the um, new electric grid infrastructure needed in Hyde Park? You, you, you know, I, I think our work at Embrace concerns ourselves with how people are socialized. At the, at the core of what, what we, we do our work, and, you know, we, we're a contributor uh, of this work and, and a lot of other racial equity pieces. Uh, and, and I like what Mariama uh, said at the beginning of her, her remarks. Um, climate is a space where other issues around racial equity are exacerbated. It's where we, where we see the, the the pain area show up. Um, you know, I think as a, as as it pertains to spatial justice, um, I, I think we have to consider the other areas in, that we are socialized um, that prevent us from participating in areas that don't seem related to the things. That we're socialized in. Now, some people I imagine in, in the report that you'd mentioned earlier see taking Ubers as a way to reduce their time, but there's other other reasons why we've been socialized to not take public transportation. For years and years and years, uh, we've been socialized that anything public is uh, inferior to the uh to the private, right? The public good, the 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 public schools. Uh, in public universities are not as good as private. And so when we come to this issue where anything that's public, public transportation is not as good in private, why would you think about the public as your first means of transportation when the private transportation makes more sense? And so I, I think we concern ourselves with the way that folks are socialized. And so how do you imagine uh, a space that you don't feel like you belong when you've not been socialized into that new space, you can't imagine yourself in that new space. You don't see yourself belonging to that new space. 
Uh, and so I think the work of, uh, of togetherness and belonging uh, has a direct correlation uh, with, with the, the conversation we're having around climate. Uh, we, we don't do enough, uh, we haven't done enough around acknowledging past wrongs to get people to participate in a way where they can see themselves. Uh, we go straight to redress. And unfortunately, because of time, we feel like we, we, we got to address these issues, right? We got to go straight to redress. But without acknowledgement of, of past injustices, without acknowledging the state that we're in, uh, I think we're going to be hard pressed to get people to participate fully to, to the maximum of their ability. I agree. And um, uh, I think there was a question in the chat for uh, you to repeat the eight harm areas, which I did just share, but um, maybe maybe for the group that might be worth flashing up on the screen again um, on, on the slides. But in the meantime, um, I have another question for the group. Um, and I know, um, Reverend Mariama, you have a conflict. So um, I don't want to keep you if you have to have to dash. Um, I'll give a short answer and then I'll run. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, maybe one, maybe this might be the last one, but uh, where do you think major investments are most needed in the city? And I know this is like such a hard question or can be a hard question, but how do you think they can be best structured to provide climate benefits to the community in and around Boston? Yeah, so I mean, I think the the people who have not benefited in the past are the ones that need to benefit the most now. And that's why I think I said this during my presentation and I'll repeat it. We are not doing equal work, we are doing equitable work, which means we have to first go to the places where people have not had enough and bring them up to um, a level where they are uh, at parity with other folks. And that that's really where we're focusing. When we're looking at trees, we're asking, what are the neighborhoods that have the least trees? How do we make that move forward? We're looking at neighborhoods like East Boston. We're looking um, at neighborhoods like Dorchester and Roxbury. So that has to be the lens we make all of our investments for. Where is there been the greatest harm? How do we repair that? I think the second piece is um, everybody needs to lean in where they are. Right. So it's not just the city. Right. We're also looking um, we're in conversation with Eversource. We're in conversation with other folks who've also participated in that and said, how can you also support this? First, let's at least make sure you're not replicating some of those those harms of the past, because I want us to be really clear. We haven't all stopped using those past, past policies. And so we we certainly have to not be replicating previous harmful policies and stop that. And then we have to go and ask, how do we repair those? Um, and I think it's really important. We, I, I, I say this to people all the time. If you come from a more privileged community, we need you to raise your hand. When people are asking the question, where are we gonna put substations? I need Brookline to raise their hand and not at, have the next substation go into Boston, right? Uh, if we're talking about, let's really focus on how do we, if there is burden, how do we distribute that burden fairly? How do we not ask the communities that got always borne the burden in the past to keep bearing them again? And so I think there are ways for folks that are in communities that have been harmed to raise their hand about what we need to do to repair, but there's also a role for folks who have traditionally benefited to say, y'all, we can't keep having it this way. We need to take on the, uh, um, the, the utility infrastructure that we've usually outsourced to other people. We need to actually fight for money in this next budget and say, you know what? It doesn't need to come here. It needs to go to the neighborhood that's experienced greatest harm. And that's not usually how we show up. Um, but I think we can show up that way. And I think if more of us do, and that goes for neighborhoods, that goes for residences, that goes for institutions. How do you look at where have you benefited and where have you gotten the burden? And how do you make sure that you participate in a way that says, let's do the equitable thing? Um, I think it's also the case that there is um, a difficult uh, political balancing act that uh, needs to be engaged with. The um, uh, long-term investments in infrastructure or in uh, the uh, workforce development um, may not show results for five to eight or 10 or 15 years. Um, and and uh, those are the kinds of investments that have to be made, but they're not particularly visible uh, to people uh, within the neighborhoods. And that means 
um, that you also need to invest in those uh, kinds of uh, uh, landscaping and, and other artifacts that become in, uh, visible in a way where neighborhood people uh, can see the benefits and can see the results. That means uh, taking the vacant lots and turning them into parks. It means uh, creating spaces where um, uh, there, there may have been um, other kinds of buildings or infrastructure and turning those into parks. Um, it means uh, creating more green spaces, which can be done uh, within a year or two, as opposed to over a five to 10 year time frame. Um, and the prioritization has to be on both. That is to say, uh, the long-term investments, but also uh, the shorter term uh, investments that uh, show what the value um, of, uh, of moving towards a greener future would be. And Amari, do you want to add anything to where you think the cl major climate investments are needed? Yeah, you know, I, I would have to agree with um, Reverend Mariama. You know, I think at the end of the day, um, the communities that have been historically marginalized have to be at the center of uh, um, the change and have to be the key beneficiaries. I, I think the end result, the socialization part of it is that uh, racism has caused a poverty of empathy. Uh, and that poverty of empathy prevents folks from uh, being vulnerable enough to let someone go first in line, uh, to let other communities be the beneficiary of benefits, uh, to have other uh, communities be beneficiary of resources uh, because of zero-sum thinking, because of this poverty of empathy, because of this uh, fear of um, of being left behind, of uh, somehow... Um, not getting your fair share. And so um, I, I think this the redress part of climate uh, justice has to be at the center of every initiative and communities that have been negatively impacted uh, need to be at the center of it. Well, I know we have we have two minutes left in the webinar. I don't think we can squeeze in one more question, but so I, I think we might just wrap it up here and um, at, on, on that note. So thank you so much to you both and Trevor and Mariama who had to hop off for another conflict. Um, but thank you so much for your time, your knowledge and your wisdom and um, to Amari, your, your partnership on the report. I'm going to drop the link to it again for those of you who might not have gotten it in the beginning. Um, but this was super valuable. And to everyone listening, thank you all for joining. Uh, this recording will be available online. So thanks so much. Thank you. Great job. All right. Bye, everyone.